Whenever you are asked for a maximum and a minimum resultant vector of two forces, or any min minimum and maximum resultant, um, you're always going to take a look at what would happen if I added the two values together. So, for example, 15 plus 28, and if I subtracted them, 28 minus 15. And you're going to land up with answers of 43 and 13 newtons. The adding together is when the two forces are at zero degrees to one another. In other words, they're pulling in the exact same direction. When they are pulling in opposite directions, so that's at 180 degrees to each other, here they're at zero degrees, and here they are at 180 degrees to each other, you'll get your minimum. Now the truth of the matter is that no matter what other angle exists between those two forces, you will have a value of the resultant, and I can get the resultant by constructing a parallelogram and putting the diagonal there. The resultant will always be some number between 43 and 13. So the maximum in this case is 43, the minimum is 13. An object has a mass of 120 kilograms and it's placed in the center of a circle with a radius of 63 millimeters. A second object with double the mass, in other words 240 kilograms, is placed anywhere on the circumference of that circle. So anywhere 63 millimeters away from the center of the circle. What is the magnitude of the gravitational forces between these masses? So this is a simple application of saying F is equal to G M1 M2 over R squared. A couple of things to think about. Make sure you go and get the right G value off your information sheet. And then you must make sure that when they've given you masses that they are in kilograms. In this case they were in kilograms. And you also need to make sure that your distance is in meters. And in this case it's not in meters. So I need to divide by a thousand and then so often people forget to square that denominator. Don't forget to square the denominator when you are doing your calculation and you get an answer of 4,8 times 10 to the power of negative 4 newtons. The next one is an electrostatic example and here I've been given two point charges. I get two values of coulombs, so two charge values. And I am told that nano is times 10 to the negative 9. I'm not sure that they're obliged to tell you that it's times 10 to the negative 9, but it's nice of them to do so. And they are placed the distance apart. Remember that millimeters again needs to be changed into meters. And if we're calculating an electrostatic force, force is equal to K Q1 Q2 over R squared. Go dig around for the right K value, which in this case is 9 times 10 to the power of 9, is on your information sheet. And now you need to put your charges in carefully. 6,3 times 10 to the negative 9. And I'm just going to have to go below here, sorry. 5,7 times 10 to the negative 9. Don't really have to worry about the positive and the negative signs. Because all that this positive and negative tell me is that in the end, my force is going to be attractive. And then I divide that whole value by... 0, 0,029 and again I do not forget to square my denominator and I land up with 3,84 times 10 to the negative 4 newtons. I'm here, I'm given a gravitational acceleration on the earth and a new planet gets discovered and it has a mass that is triple that of the earth and a radius that is one third that of the Earth. So what is going to happen to the gravitational acceleration near to this newly discovered planet? First thing that we're going to have to do is we're going to have to think about what is gravitational acceleration here on Earth and our force mass times gravitational acceleration is always equal to g, the mass of the object, whatever it is, multiplied by the mass of the Earth, divided by the radius of the Earth. Why don't we use a capital R? And we're going to square that. 
Now, the mass of whatever object it is cancels away, and my gravitational acceleration is going to be directly proportional to the mass of the Earth and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So this was my original g value. What is going to happen to it? Instead of, so this we'll call g1, my new gravitational force is going to be equal to g, a mass that is triple the mass of the Earth, and a radius that is one-third. And we're going to have to square one-third the radius of the Earth. So let's rework that out and we get g, 3m, divided by 1 over 9, r squared. Now remember, when you've got a denominator in a denominator, it becomes a numerator. So that's going to become g, m, times 3. I'm also going to bring this 9 to the top, times 9 over r squared. But I do know that gm over r squared is equal to my original g1 value over there. So I am going to substitute in whatever that g1 value was times 3 times 9. And I was told at the beginning that that g value was 9,8 meters per second squared. So I am in a position to substitute that value in and I land up with that being 9,8, and I get 264,6 meters per second squared is the new gravitational acceleration. The important thing with this particular example is to carefully work through the changes that have occurred to the original. I make sure I get an expression for the original. I work out a new value for the new gravitational acceleration and then I extract those numbers out and see how they change the original expression. This method is very helpful whenever you are doing examples with ratio changes. I've got two pith balls now. They've got charges of microcoulombs and microcoulombs, there's a negative sign over here, which means again I'm going to land up with an attractive force. I should have put an attractive force on the last one. They are more close to each other. What is the new charge on them? Whenever I've got two forces, they're going to add and then split over the two, so it becomes negative two microcoulombs. They could have gone on then to say, and what the, would the force be between them? And then you would substitute in with F is equal to K, Q1, Q2, and that would be before, divided by R squared, and then afterwards the new charges would be negative 2, negative 2, and you could see a change that perhaps had occurred.